Good morning, good day uh, to all participants, to our speakers. Thank you, Ajeng, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today um, as we welcome um, participants coming into the session. Um, on the on the housekeeping, just to uh, welcome as well Russian speaking participants. Um, the training will be delivered today in English but you have the opportunity to uh, get Russian uh, interpretation. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will find the two channels, Russian and, uh, and English. Uh, participants are muted for the duration of the training, but you have a chat that you can use to put in questions, comments, just to present and to introduce yourself. And uh, um, we can allow you to speak in case you want to intervene. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask us um, the floor. Also from my side, welcome very much. And thank you, uh, Elena and Andrea, for uh, agreeing to be with us today and uh, and to deliver this introductory uh, training. Ajeng, if you could just uh, put my slides on, I will quickly run through an introduction before giving the floor to Andrea and um, Elena. So we've we've entitled this uh, this introductory tra training alliances: the importance of prison monitoring bodies in the promotion of harm reduction in prison and closed setting. And Ajeng told you why. Um, we are trying with uh, these trainings and a number of uh, work, uh, different types of work at HRIs to let's say bridge. Um, the world of harm reductionists, people who have been working on harm reduction for many years and who have been trying to uh, provide and introduce and advocate for the introduction of harm reduction services also in prison, and people who have a mandate of monitoring uh, prison conditions, including the access to health for people living in prison. This is, has been the objective of, of the training today. Next slide, uh, please. Just a couple of words of introduction for Harm Reduction International. For those of you who might not know us, um, we are an international NGO and our mandate is that of reducing the negative health, social and legal impacts of drug use and drug policy. So we work with very closely on uh, harm reduction uh, policies and services, but also increasingly on drug policy reform. We promote the rights of people who use drugs and their communities, and we do so through uh, research and advocacy. We started our work in the 90s with the first international harm reduction conferences um, in Liverpool, in England, which was one of the countries, one of the first countries introducing needle and syringe exchange for people who use drugs for the prevention of HIV at the time. Um, and we work to ensure that life saving harm reduction interventions are adequately funded. Uh, we monitor gaps and progress globally in the availability of health and social services for people who use drugs. And we try to ensure that nobody's rights are violated in the name of drug control. Next slide, uh, please. So the um, the present, as Ajin said, the present training has been organized in the framework of the Prison Health and Rights Consortium. This is uh, an initiative um, which is looking at access to health, uh, healthcare and justice for people in prison in Europe. We've been working closely with the European Prison Litigation Network. Uh, the the um, Prison Health and Rights Consortium is funded by Robert Carr Fund. fund. Um, and we've been working closely uh, with colleagues in Eastern Europe and Central Asia in a number of countries. We've been concentrating heavily on Russia and Ukraine um, and, and the dreadful situation there when it comes to harm reduction in prison, but also other countries, um, Georgia, Moldova, Romania. Um, and this is why we have also um, a Russian translation today, because we expect some participants from, from, from the region. Um, why do we work as Harm Reduction International in uh, prison settings? Because we know that what, at least one in five people in prison worldwide is held for drug offenses. And 90% of people who inject drugs will be incarcerated at some points of their lives. So people who use drugs have a close relationship, a very unfortunate close relationship with, with, relationship with prison settings. Women population constitute a very um, small proportion of the global prison population, but they are increasing at a faster rate than men. And women have specific needs uh, when it comes to, uh, also when it comes to uh, health services. 
Um, so we, we try to have a specific focus um, on women. And we know that 35% of women being imprisoned for are, uh, for drug offense, are 35% of women being imprisoned are for drug offenses uh, globally. And people who use drugs represent up to 50% of the world's prison population. So we really have, we feel the responsibility of continuing to advocate for health and social services to be available within the prison setting and therefore also harm reduction. Uh, next slide, please. We have started working uh, with harm reduction in, in prison at the beginning of our, of our work, knowing that people in prison are at greater risk of HIV, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, COVID-19, for example. We have been um, producing a number of research and investigation during the COVID-19 pandemic to look at how COVID-19 has impacted the prison setting overall and how it has limited often the access to other health services, including harm reduction. And you will um, find some of this research available in our website as, as we go along. Um, Ajin will put in the uh, in the chat the links to the research that can be downloaded. So um, it's for you to access it. We have been uh, looking at the risk of overdose, which is uh, increased for people coming out from released from, from prison. Um, and we have always argued that people in prison require access to harm reduction services. The increased risk of overdose, HIV, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis in closed settings means that harm reduction interventions have even a greater potential in prisons and are really necessary in prison. To the contrary, we know that there is very limited availability of harm reduction interventions in prison. Needle and syringe exchange is available in a very limited number of countries around the world in prison. Uh, OAT, opiate agonist treatment, is available in some, but not all uh, countries around the world. Um, and if you want to find more about this, uh, we do publish every two years our global state of harm reduction where we provide information on the uh, actual status of harm reduction services uh, and the, the availability of those services, both in the community and uh, um, in prison. So um, that's available also uh, through our, um, our website. Next slide, please. But we also know that harm reduction engages a number of rights in prison. So we have traditionally been looking at harm reduction mostly from a public health perspective, from a perspective of uh, increasing health of people who live in prison and people who work in prison and the communities overall. Uh, we've been looking at cost effectiveness of harm reduction interventions, and we have we've been trying constantly to advocate for their availability in the community and in prison and for the funding for harm reduction. But we also know that harm reduction, as I said, engages many rights. You see a list of them, uh, or, and it's not an extensive, it's not an exclusive list on this uh, on the on this slide. We look in particular in the right to the right uh, to health. Uh, we look also uh, at freedom from from torture and ill treatment, and this will be one of the key elements which will be touched upon in the course of this uh, uh, of this training. So we are looking um, at prisons also from a human rights angle and try to engage with those actors who have a mandate uh, to um, work in prison and as far as the training of today is concerned to monitor prison conditions, also looking at the violation of, of those rights. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so today, as Ajin was saying in the introduction, we are looking at prison monitoring mechanisms. Uh, prison monitoring mechanisms exist under the mandate of the United Nations. They exist in the framework of the Council of Europe. Um, cascading down, they should also exist uh, in most uh, um, member states uh, who have in most uh, countries which have the, the freedom somehow to, to choose uh, how these monitoring bodies are organized. So they will work differently country to country. 
um, but they have a clear access to, um, they enjoy unhindered access to all places of detention. So they definitely can be an ally, an ally when it comes to monitoring the condition of detentions, also with reference to, to health. Uh, and they are mandated to prevent torture and ill treatment, included, including in the context of accessing health, health services. And their work is based on dialogue and cooperation. So there are clearly ways in which civil society can better engage with uh, prison monitoring bodies in order to join forces to um, uh, advocate for accessing uh, harm reduction uh, in prison. And before passing the, the floor to our two amazing speakers today, and before I introduce them uh, properly, I uh, just remind you of the availability also of this publication. You see the link in my, uh, in my slide. This is a monitoring tool uh, on HIV, uh, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and harm reduction in prison, uh, which Harm Reduction International has been, um, uh, has been uh, producing a few years ago. Uh, but it's still relevant when it comes to um, bridging uh, the, the two uh, world of uh, public health and human rights when it comes to harm reduction in prison. So we provide an extensive checklist of the type of interventions when, which should be available in prison settings when it comes to uh, preventing and treating HIV, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and ultimately providing life-saving harm reduction interventions for, for people, people in prison. It's available in English on our website, but it has also been translated into Russian. So in case someone wanted to uh, get access to the Russian version, version just uh, get in uh, contact with us. Um, so let me introduce our two speakers today, who will, uh, and here are my contacts in the last in the last slide. Let me introduce our two speakers today. Dr. Elina Steinerte is an academic and human rights lawyer with over twenty over twenty years of experience. She is a member of the UN Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture, the SPT. So one of these uh, international prison monitoring bodies. So she will speak out of experience. Uh, she is also an academic uh, with extensive teaching background. She's been working in a number of uh, countries, uh, in Latvia, the UK, and other countries. And she has provided expert advice on a variety of criminal justice reforms, including pre-trial pre detention, overuse of imprisonment, overcrowding, and independent oversight over the places of deprivation of liberty and on child justice. Thank you, Elena, for being with us today. Uh, Andrea Lax um, is currently undertaking a PhD uh, on the implementation of the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, the OPCAT, so known. She has worked as coordinating coordination director for the Australian Capital Territory National Preventative, Pre Preventative Mechanism, so she has experience within uh, one national uh, preventative mechanism. And she has previously volunteered as human, humanitarian observers with the Red Cross. And she's been um, a criminal defense uh, lawyer uh, as well, uh, with specific, uh, specific attention to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, so indigenous people in, in Australia. Thank you, Andrea, very much for being with us. Uh, I understand that Andrea and Elena will alternate um, in, the, in the speech today. Um, so I pass the floor to you for the uh, intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Andrea, would you like to start? Since we don't have much time, but quite a lot of ground to cover, uh, introductions done, I think we can get back in. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Andrea. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to start off, start off with just a sort of, it might not seem very brief, but a very brief overview of um, relevant sort of human rights, um, international law uh, relating to um, places of detention with a particular focus on, on health care, because I know that's what everyone is, is sort of interested in today. Um, 
So there's already been mention on this uh, norm around the prohibition of torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, and I won't go into the definition now because I think Alina will, will touch on it later, but I will say that it's quite a lengthy and detailed definition. And I want to sort of start off what I'm talking about by highlighting that civil society actors like yourselves have played a really important role in developing our understanding of what actually constitutes torture. So in other words, interpreting what this definition means in practice or in, in people's everyday lives. Um, so that includes academics, lawyers, litigating matters in courts, doctors and psychologists and NGOs. Um, and my particular focus is on those that represent incarcerated minorities like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So health, Aboriginal health and legal organisations have played a role in that as well. Um, additional to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, we have the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that states that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And in particular, no one shall be subjected without their free consent to medical or scientific experimentation. So they're two of the key treaties, um, but there are quite a number of other international human rights instruments to which I would refer you, um, including the ones that prohibit torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, that includes the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Body of Principles for the Protection of All Persons under any form of detention or imprisonment, and the Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials. Um, also additional to that, I thought it might be useful to draw your attention to obligations of medical practitioners with regards to torture and ill treatment, including in detention. Um, particularly the UN principles of medical ethics relevant to the role of health personnel, particularly physicians in the protection of prisoners um, and detainees against torture, um, which states that it's a contravention of medical ethics for health personnel, particularly physicians, to certify or to participate in the certification of the fitness of prisoners or detainees for any form of treatment or punishment that may adversely affect their physical or mental health or which is not in accordance with the relevant international instruments, which I've already referred to today. Um, and this, of course, would be applicable to those health practitioners involved in the healthcare provided to incarcerated people who use drugs. Um, their obligations also don't end there. Um, would also recommend you have a look at the United Nations Istanbul Protocol, um, which is intended to serve as uh, international guidelines for the assessment of persons who allege torture and ill treatment, for investigating cases of alleged torture and for reporting findings to the judiciary or any other investigative body. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of torture and ill treatment and, and the prohibition around that. But more generally, um, there are a number of international instruments which look at rights of incarcerated people. So for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, talks about all persons deprived of their liberty um, having a right to be treated with humanity and with respect for their inherent dignity, among other things as well. And particularly for today's focus, um, there are applicable human rights with regards to health care for incarcerated people, um, including those people who use drugs, who um, end up in prison, and they are grossly um, overrepresented, as already um, has been noted by Chinzia earlier on. Um, you've probably heard, or maybe you will, once you look into this after today, about the Mandela Rules, uh, the UN Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners, um, which states that prisoners should enjoy the same standards of healthcare that are available in the community and should have access to necessary healthcare services free of charge without discrimination on the grounds of their legal status. And I want to highlight that um, part about regardless of their legal status, because that protection, that right refers to someone who is serving their sentence, um, someone who might be remanded in custody while their criminal law matters are still being finalised before the courts. It's for people who might be held in um, administrative post-sentence detention. Um, it applies for people who are either in a public prison or a privately run prison, or sometimes you might have public prisons where the healthcare um, services are actually subcontracted out to private providers. So really, when we're looking at this right, no one should be falling through the cracks, regardless of 
um, who is running the prison um, or for whatever reason they find themselves um, incarcerated at that location. And the obligation to provide equivalence of medical care to people deprived of their liberty is also echoed in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which states that the right of everyone, there's a right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Um, there are other more specific sets of principles, which I think would be of use to your work as well. For example, there's the Bangkok rules, um, and they refer specifically for incarcerated women. Um, and one of the um, issues that's highlighted in that is that health screening of women prisoners shall include comprehensive screening to determine health, primary health care needs and also shall determine the existence of drug dependency. Um, and then there's also the United Nations rules for the protection of juveniles deprived of their liberty. Um, and that also looks specifically around the specialised um, rehabilitation programs that should be administered by qualified personnel um, as well uh, in when they are incarcerated. Um, and while it's important to be aware of all of these various international treaties and principles which address healthcare, including for detained people um, as a human right, I think it's also crucial to be cognizant of the different contexts in which you're all working. Uh, I'm not sure who's here today, but I can say it's different even across Australian states and territories. Um, and that's going to really assist in developing an effective strategy for hu using human rights in your advocacy and your work generally with the view to improve access to healthcare and detention and by extension to normalise a human, uh, sorry, a harm reduction um, approach with regards to incarcerated people. Um, and without getting too technical, um, it's I do think it's important to also consider whether international law provisions that I've outlined today are binding or not in the country in which you find yourself. Um, there are some rights that are kind of automatic, they're accepted universally binding norms, but sometimes they only become sort of legally binding after a country has ratified a treaty. Um, and the reality, as we all know, is even if these um, sort of rights are binding, there's obligations on states, they can still breach those. Um, and that can even be a case where there's domestic legislation incorporating those international norms at the domestic level. So an example in a slightly different context, the Queensland government in Australia recently suspended its own Human Rights Act to enable it to detain children in police cells rather than um, in youth detention facilities. And so I guess turning now to, to harm reduction and human rights in prisons, um, just want to flag that, of course, there's limitations in advocating for equivalency of healthcare when the healthcare available in the community itself falls short, which is often the case. Um, and that includes for uh, um, people who use drugs. But there are also circumstances where comparing um, the care provided in prisons and the care provided in community can actually be effective. Um, and always, I guess, coming back to this idea that human rights shouldn't be seen as aspirational. I think often um, they're sort of understood as this thing that we should aim for, but really they're, they're the minimum, they're the base, they're, they're the floor, they're, they're not the ceiling. And um, I suppose I would always encourage um, civil society actors and prison monitoring bodies to be more ambitious in improving protections for incarcerated people who use drugs. Um, and I just want to provide you an example from the Australian context, because I think I've just talked about all this sort of law and hypothetical um, issues. And I think it's always good to ground it in, a, in an actual real life example. Um, and so although the example I'm going to give you is not specifically about a prison monitoring body's findings or recommendations, um, it's in relation to a coronial inquest into a death in custody that I think is going to be really of assistance um, for prison monitoring bodies in Australia in their future work in developing their own expectations or standards for prison healthcare, which is also something that civil society actors can contribute to, and I'll speak to that at the very end. Um, just in case there are any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people online or who will watch the recording afterwards, I do need to provide a warning that I'll be um, using the name of an Aboriginal person who has who is deceased. Um, and I won't go into the details of her passing because they're particularly distressing, but I can also share in the chat if you want the coroner's findings and recommendations. Um, Veronica Nelson was a proud Gundijmara. 
Jajawarung, Wiradjuri and Yorta, Yorta Woman. So these are different Indigenous nations in Australia. Um, and she passed at Dane Phyllis Frost Centre on the 2nd of January 2020. The subsequent coronial inquest examined the adequacy of the healthcare that she was provided in prison. Um, upon admission, Ver Veronica disclosed um, that she uses used opioids um, and she was prescribed a standard withdrawal pack. Um, and during that inquest, um, it was found that drug withdrawal is the most common medical issue for women um, presenting at, at prison at that particular prison in Victoria. And staff estimated that between 50 and 90% of women arriving at the prison were withdrawing from drugs. Um, during the inquest, the coroner heard from formerly incarcerated women who ex experienced withdrawal um, in that prison setting and also the stigma um, that they experienced and how that impacted on the healthcare that they were provided. But also, I think really usefully, there was um, an, a medical enclave of experts, so professionals who worked in the community in this space around um, providing healthcare to people who use drugs. And ultimately, the coroner was satisfied that the conduct of staff who engaged with Veronica was negatively influenced by the knowledge that she was withdrawing from drugs. And the staff knew of the potential fatality of opioid withdrawal and the severity of symptoms it may cause and found that her care and treatment by staff was influenced by drug use stigma and that this causally contributed to her passing. So that stigma was one of the reasons that she passed away in prison. So it was preventable. Um, the coroner stated that the normalization of the suffering of women experiencing drug withdrawal results in the desensitization of staff to this presentation. Desensitization to suffering rendered staff virtually unresponsive to Veronica's persistent pleas for assistance and blind to her clinical deterioration. They collectively and continually failed to recognize that she was in need, urgent need of medical care. Ultimately, the coroner recommended an urgent review of the Justice Health Opioid Substitution Therapy Guidelines. I know Chinzia has mentioned this briefly at the beginning. Um, and recommended that all women with opioid dependencies are given access to opioid substitution pharmacotherapy upon reception, including the option of methadone or suboxone, irrespective of how long they were incarcerated, including whether they were on remand. Um, and so that's kind of looking at the health aspect, but I think also usefully to, um, given the Victorian context is we have a charter of human rights and responsibilities in that jurisdiction. And the coroner also found that Veronica's um, treatment amounted to inhumane and degrading treatment contrary to section 10 of the charter. And the medical enclaves expert evidence was also crucial to the coroner's findings and recommendations. So I think this is a case that really highlights the, the strength of employing a holistic approach um, and analysis. So looking at the application of human rights in this context, including the right not to be subjected to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment while incarcerated, the right to equivalency of care, including that harm reduction re approach for incarcerated people who use drugs, but then also relying heavily on the evidence of community health care providers. Um, that brings me to an end uh, of that overview, but hopefully it's uh, it will set the scene for Alina to now speak to um, the prevention of torture and um, ill treatment in prisons. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, so good morning, everyone, once again. Um, I actually sort of looking at my slides, I do have some slides prepared. Um, and listening to what Andrea was saying and also recalling um, Chinzia's helpful slides, I've decided to shuffle things around um, just ever so slightly. And I'm going to start with a very short two minute video, um, which tells about um, a study that was conducted by the United Nations Work Group on Arbitrary Detention. On this note, just a warning also, um, I am former member and former chair rapporteur of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention completed that mandate at the end of last year. And um, during that time, um, it was the working group which conducted um, this particular study that I would like to tell you about. And this is a study on arbitrary detention and drug policies and how drug policies are conducive towards arbitrary detention worldwide. So it's not uh, just the issue of torture and freedom from torture rather, but it's also a question of arbitrary deprivation of liberty. So without further ado, um, let me see if I can get to my screen.
verdad la experiencia en la cárcel pues, fue algo desagradable. ¿no? Durante 11 años viví en un centro penitenciario donde me alojaron en un lugar varonil, donde viví cierta serie de violencias, pero sí fue una experiencia pues yo considero que debería de haber alternativas de prisión y que el tema de adicciones o de sustancias psicoadictivas es un tema de salud. Sin embargo, eso se criminaliza en el país y lo único que hace el Estado es meterte a centros penitenciarios sin atender la problemática o el verdadero problema que son el consumo de sustancias. Looking at the prison population globally, around 20% of those who are currently in prison are there for drug-related crimes including personal use and perception. This leads to serious issues concerning the human rights protection and of course leads to overcrowding in these detention facilities, which in itself is a human rights violation. What's really needed is uh, for global uh, community to really understand that drug use is a public health problem and should be dealt with within the health and public health system rather than the criminal justice system. In this study, the working group calls for the closure of all state and private mandatory drug treatment facilities that hold people against their will. Drug dependency and use must not be treated as a criminal matter, but rather a health issue and addressed with rights-based measures. Sorry, now I have to get out of the screen and find my other screen. Mm. I'm certainly not here for my technical skills, um, which is here. So the video that I just showed you um, was concerning the study which was conducted by the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And I here have on the slide for you the, um, the UN uh, doc document reference number. Um, this was a study that was mandated by the Human Rights Council um, uh, when it renewed the mandate of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. For those of you who are familiar with the Human Rights Council system, you will know that this happens every three years for all thematic mandates. And uh, so when renewing the mandate of the working group for the next uh, three years in 2019, um, the Human Rights Council requested that the working group carries out the specific study on arbitrary detention, arbitrary deprivation of liberty, um, as it is impacted, as the phenomenon is impacted by the drug policies. So the key findings of, of this study, uh, so the working group started work on this in 2019 and the study was presented in 2021. We were slightly, there was a slight setback in the scheduling of this, as uh, we all know, the pandemic struck the world and it also, of course, had impact on the ability of the working group to deliver it perhaps as swiftly as we hoped, but nevertheless, we were done in 2021 and uh, the study was presented to the Human Rights Council. The key findings of this study, um, I don't think will come as a particular surprise to all of you working in this area. Uh, people who use drugs are particularly at risk of arbitrary deprivation of liberty, and there are increasing instances of arbitrary detention as a consequence of the so-called uh, war on drugs uh, policies uh, worldwide. Um, how is this happening? It is um, already something that Chinzia very helpfully highlighted, very stri strikingly highlighted earlier. It is war on drugs and the criminalization of possessing paraphernalia associated with drug use. The issue here, unfortunately, no, when it, when it comes down to uh, drug-related uh, offenses, the question of proportionality is particularly difficult. 
um, most of these, uh, uh, quite a lot of these crimes do not involve any violence whatsoever. Yet, when we look at the punishment which is rendered for um, drug associated crimes, uh, we know that, uh, that, that, that the issue of proportionality leaves quite a lot to desire. The second um, big cohort in the findings of our working group on arbitrary detention in this study is the denial of fair trial rights. And there's just um, some examples which I have highlighted here for you in the brackets. So what the working group, for example, noted was that quite often suspects are um, interviewed, interrogated when they are still under the influence. Um, there's um, quite often testing undertaken without consent of the individual concerned, or this consent is being obtained um, during the time when the individual is unable to give um, a learned drug. Across the board, we see overuse and pre, uh, prolonged pretrial detention in uh, uh, when we are talking about drug related crime. We are talking about also, unfortunately, about withholding of substitution therapy from drug dependent suspects, both as a tool in terms of to induce confessions quite often, um, quite often just as, as an additional uh, form of punishment, but then also quite often uh, because there is nothing available. Um, number of countries that uh, working group visited, that I visited as part of the working group and arbitrary detention mandate, we saw an issue that while there were services available in the community, the moment that the very second an individual was arrested by the police and ended up in the police station, there was no procedures in place whatsoever to provide any uh, substitution therapy while the individual is in um, uh, uh, police custody, which of course uh, led to individuals having to go undergo, undergo very painful so-called cold turkey situations um, due to their uh, withdrawal syndromes. Um, turning back to um, the study disproportionate sentencing, I already mentioned that um, criminalization of drug use uh, also, of course, uh, facilitated the deployment of the criminal justice system against drug users in a discriminatory way. And I think the um, exceptionally sad example that was uh, highlighted by Andrea from Australia, from Victoria, about this um, Aboriginal uh, lady uh, is, is a stark example of just how discriminatory, inherently discriminatory, these um, drug criminalization, um, uh, how it manifests itself in a very discriminatory way. And that also highlights the next uh, point by the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, poor and or complete denial of specific healthcare in detention. And finally, um, perhaps slightly outside the remit of our conversation of our uh, training today, but the working group also looked uh, in quite detail onto the forced treatment uh, for drug dependent um, individuals um, and how this uh, is not quite often provided by healthcare professionals. So I think when it comes down to um, harm reduction in prisons, the study on working group and object detention is one of the, the most recent key documents uh, looking at how drug policies manifest themselves and uh, worldwide, leading to um, uh, arbitrary deprivation of liberty. This is also very closely linked to what we are talking about today, and that is prevention of torture and uh, inhuman or degrading treatment. And um, um, so this is the links where you can afterwards find both the study and the video if you so feel inclined. And um, this leads me to uh, what I wanted to talk about, um, what Andrea already mentioned, what we need to talk about. Um, it is uh, what is torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, there is a legal instrument, the uh, Convention Against Torture, which clearly defines uh, the concept of torture in itself. And here I have uh, the very long definition, uh, which is provided in Article 1 of the Convention Against Torture. So, meaning any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third person 
information or a confession punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspect, suspected of having committed or intimidating or coercing him or a third person or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. So the key elements here are really four um, and torture really is uh, quite um, strictly defined in international law. It is a question of suffering, whether that would be physical suffering or mental suffering. There needs to be intention to inflict such suffering, in, in, intention to inflict it with a certain purpose. And there has to be a, a link with an authority, um, whether that is a direct or indirect link. Um, what is by far more difficult in international law to define is um, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. It is quite clear that in those instances we're also talking about the infliction of intense physical or mental suffering. But I suppose uh, from the legal perspective of view the question is the level of that suffering. Um, so in terms of inhuman or degrading treatment, this could include serious physical assault or psychological abuse in the care settings, cruel um, conditions of detention or real threat of torture. When we're talking about uh, degrading treatment, it could be um, a treatment which is considered extremely humiliating or undignified. And of course, the elements here, and I'm sure you all straight away notice that it's ex exceptionally personal to an individual circumstance. What might be um, a suffering for one person might perhaps not reach quite the same degree of suffering for another person. So this individual approach in assessing whether torture or inhuman or degrading treatment has taken place is are particularly important here. What I personally, what I always find useful um, when thinking about this very legal term torture, and I want to underline here that I'm really talking about legal definitions which are of paramount importance when it comes down to um, uh, legal settings, litigation, etc is think about torture and human trade, um, degrading treatment as a kind of a sliding scale. If you find somebody in a situation of inhuman treatment, for example, and if that treatment continues, the chances are that you are on a slippery slope towards torture. Um, so thinking about perhaps in this increasing scale um, from start of the suffering of infliction of a pain upon an individual, might be helpful way of understanding of how inhuman degrading treatment can then, as the time progresses, grow into torture. That is not to say that a treatment in itself straight away could not constitute torture um, as well. So what is important and what is important when it comes down to prison monitoring and for our training to today is to, of course, understand that prison setting is this balance of power is completely shifted in that the authorities are in charge of the prisons. At least they must be in charge of the prisons. I know that there are countries where um, the self-governance element, official or unofficial, is, is quite stark. And I noticed um, among the participants, as you were um, introducing yourselves, there are certainly some of you who will uh, question the extent to which authorities are in charge of some of the prison facilities in your country. But in principle, it is the state who must be in charge of the prisons uh, of the country. And, and therefore, it is uh, this element of authority becomes very important because, of course, as you remember, when we looked at the torture definition, if we don't have a link to a state authority, be it direct or indirect, the question of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment, as it is encapsulated in Article 1 of the Convention Against Torture, does not really arise. When it comes down to prison monitoring and what 
the are the aims of, of our training today why do we monitor and how is prison monitoring linked to the issue of torture to the issue of inhuman or degrading treatment and punishment it is the perspective uh, we come from the perspective of prevention in order to prevent something you need to know what's happening on the ground and to this end knowing um, visiting prisons on a regular basis with the aim to monitor to see what is happening on the ground with the detainees what services are being provided to the individuals who are deprived of their liberty in these facilities and this provides you with an uh, opportunity to assess are the standards, those standards that Andrea was alluding to at the beginning, of which there are lengthy international and ideally in the national context, you would have more detailed standards in relation to the facilities. Are these actually being implemented in practice? If they are not being implemented in practice or maybe not translating in a practice in the way which would achieve the aims which are set out in these standards, which may be translated in a way where you feel that we are stepping now on this slippery slope towards inhuman or degrading treatment, towards torture. How could we reverse that situation um, and find practical solutions so that individual individuals who are deprived of their liberty, that they are not subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment um, or, God forbid, um, torture. So the key element when we talk about prison monitoring in the context of, of, how, of, of this training is really the preventive action in order to catch something before it leads to the problem of inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment or torture. There are a number of different types of prison monitoring um, that exists um, in different countries. And it is very difficult to give you an exact um, uh, blueprint of how prison monitoring exactly happens in your country. And I think if there is uh, one homework that I might invite you to, to do at the end of this training is to do this mapping for your country um, to really be aware when uh, we talk about prison monitoring, how does that actually happen in your country? And to give you an idea, maybe some bullet points um, as you for, for this uh, mapping, um, I would like to highlight where you might find these prison monitoring bodies. Um, it is, I think quite often when we talk about prison monitoring, there is a tendency and inertia to straightaway think about civil society independent oversight. But what is also very important to remember that there are other prison monitoring bodies and the first body, the, the first um, cohort of bodies are actually state authorities, um, which usually um, provide some form of oversight, maybe not that traditional independent prison monitoring that we understand when we, when we say words prison monitoring, but nevertheless, uh, so this is, we talk about akin to self-inspection. It can be internal prison oversight mechanisms that are organized by the country in question. They can be internal to the prison, like prison audits, or they can be inspections which are carried out by state, external state bodies. So not internally within the prison, but another state authority coming to inspect the prison. Um, the most common example of this is to ensure compliance with a, a set of standards. So you could have health inspections. Um, I now live in the United Kingdom, so health and safety inspections across the board um, takes place in prison monitoring. And when you think about these health, um, health and safety inspections, I think we automatically don't think of them as prison monitoring but they actually play a very important role in ensuring precisely that standard that both Andrea and Cinzia were talking about, this equivalence of care that is available to individuals outside of the prison setting, that that should be available also within the prison setting to those who are deprived of their liberty.
And being as a, as a sort of thinking strategically about prison monitoring and who is doing what, being aware of these health and safety inspections, for example, is a key part of your prison monitoring mapping, understanding the mandate of these, of these uh, uh, compliance mechanisms, which are intrinsically built within uh, the mechanism of um, the state. There are, can be other control and compliance mechanisms which are built, for example, in con uh, contractual provisions over running of private prisons. Again, some of the participants here, I already noticed, um, come from countries where some of your prison facilities are private prisons. So they are um, contracted out by the state to a private company to run a prison. And then usually what happens in these uh, contracts between the state and the private prison company, um, there are certain standards which are built in contractual standards, the same contractual standards as one might enter a simple um, you know, services agreement, um, service provider. And there are certain elements here that the private prison contractor must comply with in order to fulfill the contractual purposes is through this sort of um, kind of a contractual oversight mechanism. Um, but if we look at it, if we're, it, it really is also a comp complementary way of state monitoring as to what is happening in the given private prison. There is also can be independent oversight bodies which are established by a state. Uh, and although they are established by a state, they operate independently of the state and they're meant to really be a sort of a critical eye um, on the state, on the prison of state to ensure that whatever is happening in that prison state um, is happening in accordance with the standards set among which, of course, prohibition, absolute prohibition of torture and inhuman or degrading treatment is very um, high among the priority list. So in here, in the United Kingdom, you, uh, we have Her Majesty's Inspectorate for Prisons, which is an independent body set up um, uh, in the country and carries out regular prison monitoring across the board in England and Wales. There are similar bodies which are set up in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, um, also in the um, uh, Crown Dependencies, and these provide independent oversight and report to the state with the recommendations as to how um, better the situation in prisons. Similarly to this, but nevertheless, I decided to highlight them separately, are national human rights institutions and national preventive mechanisms, which are independent bodies, um, They, but again, set up by the state, but I think their unique status warrants mentioning them separately. Although you could, if you wanted to put them under the previous bullet point as an independent oversight body established by a state. <coughs> I presume that um, all of you know what are the national human rights institutions as well as national preventive mechanisms. I note that among the participants, we have some members of the national preventive mechanisms. And we will talk a little bit more about the national preventive mechanisms as I go over the provisions of the optional protocol to convention against torture. Um, the, among others, um, again, I think it's it could be also argued uh, professional by, uh, by by state, um, but nevertheless, I think it's important to highlight them separately. Um, professional bodies, judges, prosecutors, um, sometimes doctors, uh, medical associations may set up specific um, monitoring. Um, uh, mechanisms. For example, it is quite common in some countries for prosecutors or for judges uh, to visit places of detention, including and specifically prisons, in order to ascertain um, how is uh, the uh, execution of the sentences uh, taking place. Similarly, in some countries, uh, medical professions may be setting up um, such uh, uh, regular or less regular visits, monitoring of prison facilities in order to ascertain, for example, 
um, especially um, as of late um, in the context of COVID, epidemiological situations and how these are being dealt with in the closed facilities, which are prisons. Of course, when we talk about prison monitoring, we also talk about civil society monitoring, be that national uh, civil society or international organizations. Let us not forget also about other organizations which might be visiting prison for an entirely different reasons. For example, religious organizations or education and other service um, providers who might be in prison for not primarily to monitor the conditions of detention, the treatment of prisoners, but because they are there for another reason, they might be important element in this jigsaw of monitoring of who is actually in the prison and sees prison and prisoners and has the first hand account of what's happening within the facility. And finally, you can have international organizations, I already mentioned bodies such as the United Nations work group on arbitrary, arbitrary detention, which is currently, as we speak, we're going to talk about the um, European Committee on the Prevention of Torture, uh, which is visiting under the um, European Convention on the Prevention of Torture. You have bodies like the International Committee of Red Cross. What is important when we talk about all of these different monitoring bodies, um, some of which perhaps um, don't recognize themselves as being a monitoring bodies, but I think from your perspective, as you try to understand what's going on within prisons, is knowing all of these different actors, understanding who is monitoring, or maybe thinks that they are not monitoring, but actually are monitoring, just by the fact that they are regularly present in a prison facility, understanding when are they monitoring, how are they monitoring. And it is um, important to understand that each of these different bodies has slightly different mandate, but finding a way of how that can complement what you are doing in your strategic thinking around prison monitoring and are looking for synergies on how what they are doing can support what you would like to do within prison settings is very important because of course this is how you find these pathways for uh, collaboration be they thematic on a specific issue or general in terms of uh, prevention of torture and ill treatment and this also understanding their mandates, understanding how they work, understanding their modus operandi is what allows you to find the ways of how to assist and support their mandates and in a way, in a roundabout way, work through their mandate. So for example, what I mean here, if you, um, if there are, um, Judges and prosecutors, for example, in your country are visiting prison on a regular basis. It provides you an opportunity to engage with them, for example, over sentencing guidelines, um, which is usually one of the documents which uh, go to the issue of proportionality of sentences. Um, allowing them to see the effects of where, of, for example, uh, how this disproportionate sentencing is contributing to the overcrowding in the prison. Is this an opportunity for the law profession in your country to find a way of addressing any shortcomings that might arise in the context of proportionality of sentencing and sentencing guidelines? So it is at this sort of strategic thinking, understanding, mapping the prison monitors who are operational in your jurisdiction and thinking, thinking strategically, thinking about prevention of how a situation which might be okay at this very moment, but if not addressed in future, may lead to inhuman or degrading treatment or even torture. And this leads me um, to um, the optional protocol to Convention Against Torture, which is uh, the key document um, 
human rights treaties uh, when we talk about especially about the issue of prevention um, and OPCAP has been often called uh, a different type human rights treaty a sort of new generation human rights treaty although given the fact that it's been operational for 20 years I think new generation is already um, a bit outdated term to it but nevertheless uh, we have not seen anything similar since so I think to a large extent this um, term new generation still applies although new generation has grown up a bit a little bit perhaps what is interesting about OPCAP as we know when we talk about for example, international covenant on civil and political rights. We have uh, those articles talk about a right of an individual, for example, a right to fair trial, a right to freedom of expression, a right to religion. So there is a right. And this treaty, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, obliges states to ensure these rights to all of those who are in its jurisdiction. OCAT is different. OCAT does not provide a right. It does not seek to give a redress for a breach of any substantive human rights. Because it is optional protocol to Convention Against Torture, it is intrinsically linked to Convention Against Torture, which is of which the main aim is the absolute prohibition of torture and of inhuman and degrading treatment. Punishment. And the whole aim, the whole structure of optional protocol is actually to preempt the occurrence of a breach of the most fundamental human right, which is that freedom from torture. So OPCAT, as, a, as an international human rights treaty, does not actually, in no provision, does it say you have the right not to be tortured. Rather, it provides a mechanism to ensure that that prohibition of torture, which is encapsulated in the Convention Against Torture, is ensured on the ground. And the main vehicles for achieving this is the double tier system of monitoring, of visiting regularly places of deprivation of liberty, not just prisons, but in a broad sense, and we'll talk about um, this um, in the next slide. So we have Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, which is the UN body created um, in accordance with the provisions of OPCAT. And on the national levels, each state party to OPCAT is obliged to create its own national preventive mechanism. Both of these, the SPT and the NPMs, are charged with preventive mandates with the key element being preventive visiting of the broad range of places of deprivation of liberty. So um, just last week, um, the uh, uh, member states, that we got a new member state to um, uh, op OPCAT, um, Slovakia. And at the moment we have 91 states parties. Um, so as I said, in article one, the the main obligation under OPCAT is to establish the system of regular visits, which are undertaken by independent national mechanisms, the national preventive mechanisms, which each state party to OPCAT must establish, and the international bodies, the SPT, Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. Um, and therefore, if we compare OPCAT, and we go back to what I said about this new generation international human rights treaty, I was giving you an example of the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. As you all no doubtly know very well, we have Human Rights Committee established in accordance uh, with the ICCPR, which regularly receives state reports and then produces its concluding observations um, evaluating has the state actually met its obligations under the ICCPR. This does not exist under the OPCAP. There is no state reporting obligations. Um, there is also no possibility for individuals um, to complain to the OPCAT, to the SPT, that their rights have been infringed upon. 
the main obligation of the state's parties to OPCAT is this designation of national preventive mechanism, which must comply with the key elements identified of OPCAT, such as independence, they need to have a mandate which covers a wide variety of places of deprivation of liberty, they need to be able to visit these places of detention, deprivation of liberty on a regular basis, they need to be able to operate freely, they need to be able to uh, report to states, to issue recommendations and to uh, engage with state authorities about the implementation of these recommendations. And there needs to be this, the state is obliged to cooperate with both of its national preventive mechanism and the SPT. And the SPT, similarly to national preventive mechanisms, also on a regular basis, visits states' parties, engages with the national preventive mechanism, but also we spend a lot of time actually visiting actual place of deprivation of liberty within the country. And therefore, if we compare keep giving you this example of OFCAT and the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The emphasis is not about providing accountability if a, a right has been breached. It's not about providing a redress to an individual victim or group of victims. It's not about investigating allegations of torture or ill treatment. But rather the whole focus is about ongoing constructive dialogue uh, between SPT, on the other hand, of ways of how to ensure that the system which is set up in the country is one which is not conducive towards arising situations of inhuman or degrading treatment or torture. This is all aided by principle of confidentiality where applicable, um, and there's a lot of nuances here. Um, but the whole aim is to ensure that there is this constant engagement, dialogue between the state authorities and NPMs and SPT on the other hand, so as to reduce even a mere possibility of torture and ill treatment. And therefore, there is this what I have called OPCAT's path of prevention. We have regular, including unannounced visits. Some visits may be announced, but it is important uh, that both the NPMs and the SPT can visit without announcing in advance. Visits uh, to place of detention. Um, we know that uh, through the example of the International Committee of Red Cross, um, it's years and years of work. We also know from empirical research that these regular um, visits to place of detention are important tool in preventing the occurrences of torture and other ill treatment. Um, and then you have these OPCAD bodies, the national preventive mechanisms um, on the national level and the SPT established at the level of the United Nations, which have broad preventive mandates and can look at the system wide issues. So um, in, in many respects, the visits to place of detention is almost um, as a torchlight that sheds light as to what's happening on the ground. Um, as to how the policy, the legislation is being or is not being implemented or is not producing the effects that are intended by the standards which are set in the, in the country. Um, and these visits allow them to engage at that policy legislative um, level discussion with the authorities as to what needs to change in order to eliminate the possibility, the mere possibility of inhuman or degrading treatment or torture. And it is also a possibility or, or the NPMs and the SPT quite often look at training and educational reforms in order to achieve this change, which is necessary, especially when it comes down to the practical implementation on the ground of the legislation and the policies. And all of this um, complex, um, of different uh, types of interventions is aimed at identifying the very root causes of ill treatment and working with legislative policy frameworks and their effective implementation to eliminate these very root causes of 
um, which are an ill treatment. The key in order to ascertain, or this, this torchlight, as I, as I said before, which allows you to understand how this policy and legislation is translating itself on the ground, is the broad visiting mandate, which must be given to both the SPT and the National Prevent Mechanisms. And here I have um, for you um, Article 4 of OPCAT, which is protocol. As I said before, <clears throat> both the SPT and the NPMs have the visiting mandate. Um, they must be able to visit any place under the state's jurisdiction and control where persons are or may be deprived of their liberty either by virtue of an order given by a public authority or at its instigation or with its consent or acquiescence. For me personally, I think the most important words here are persons are or may be deprived of the liberty. And I think probably not so much for our conversation today, but for a broader context, it is important to remember that an individual can be deprived of his or her liberty, not only in prisons. The deprivation of liberty can occur in a whole host of settings. And unfortunately, um, the humankind has been exceptionally inventive in finding new ways of how to deprive individuals of their liberty without calling that deprivation of liberty. And I think that is a very important element to keep in mind when you are mapping your place of deprivation of liberty in your country and understanding how this deprivation of liberty happens. Going back to the um, study that I mentioned to you earlier, a study about the working group in arbitrary detention, we found out that individuals who are um, uh, forced to undergo treatment quite, quite often have to do that in sort of sanatorium type settings, which are not perhaps the prison that one normally customarily um, associates with the place of deprivation of liberty. Um, but nevertheless, in the context of OPCAT, in the context of Article 4, such sanatoriums, such forced treatment centers, most certainly are places of deprivation of liberty, and both the SPT and the National Preventive Mechanisms are to have jurisdiction, are to be able to visit such facilities. Um, at this stage, I will, um, Andrea specifically asked me to mention, so I will very briefly, um, SPT is currently working on its very first general comment precisely on the meaning of Article 4, because as you can see, there is, um, in terms of uh, for lawyers in the audience, you can see there's quite a lot of um, uh, uh, very important legal terms here. And as you can imagine, uh, because this provision determines de facto jurisdiction, shall we say, of the SPT and NPMs, it is very important that there is a, a clear understanding of this article and its uniform um, application. Hopefully we will have the general comment with us next year, but uh, fingers crossed on that, the work is in progress. But just to very quickly, um, and DCAP, as I said, this place of deprivation of liberty, which are covered by Article 4 of OPCAP, need to be under jurisdiction or control of the state party. Um, they cover places where persons actually are deprived of liberty or may be deprived of liberty. This is a very interesting construct as such, um, and I think it's um, a very uh, good provision for, for the uh, both mandate of the SPT and NPMs as it gives the possibility of saying, well, nobody has to be there, but if there is a possibility that somebody might be there, we can still visit. And this notion of deprivation of liberty, we are talking about public or private custodial setting which person is not permitted to leave freely due to any judicial, administrative or other authority. Um, so again, this there needs to be link with the public authority. It can be direct link. So when a prison is run by a state, it's very clear who is in charge and this link with authority is plain to see. But of course, also private prisons are covered uh, because at the end of the day, the state um, is the one 
who ultimately exercises authority over private prison through the contract that it has concluded with the company, which is um, actually on the ground running the facility. So when we talk about Article 4 and OCAT and the mandate of the SPT and NPMs, um, this Article uh, 4 of OCAT ensures a very broad coverage because traditional places like prisons and police cells are covered, of course, but also less tradi tra um, traditional um, places of deprivation of liberty like um, immigration centres, transit zones and international uh, ports and airports and psychiatric institutions. All of these fall under the provisions of OPCAP. Very briefly, how does the SPT work? So this is the body which I had the honor of joining on the 1st of January of this year. Uh, the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture is composed of 25 members. Um, it visits states, uh, parties to OPCAT, so only those states, parties which have actually ratified optional protocol to Convention Against Torture. And during these visits, uh, we uh, visit, um, of course, the place of deprivation of liberty in this very broad sense of the term, which I uh, explained to you. We also engage with the national preventive mechanism, if such is established in the country. Um, uh, these would be our uh, main type of visits at the end of which initially confidential report is produced and then in accordance with article 16 of OPCAT the state is very much encouraged um, to publish this report and I believe Andrea might have one or two things to say about that but I'll leave her to that. Um, of course, SPT also has this advisory role in relation to, especially to the establishment of national preventive mechanism. As you can imagine, it probably comes to no surprise to you that the SPT, um, you know, we visit roughly around eight, nine countries a year with 90 states parties. You can do the maths and figure out how often we are able to visit each state party. And therefore, the bulk of the work and really the in my opinion, the absolute gem of the optional protocol is the national preventive mechanisms, if they are the way optional protocol in, intended them to be um, independent, well-resourced, able to engage with the state um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good faith manner in a dialogue around the uh, prevention of um, torture and ill treatment. Um, so, these national preventive mechanisms really are this national face of the optional protocol. Um, and here I have um, set out the main um, bodies, uh, the, the main features of how the national preventive mechanisms must, must look like. There are certain institutional uh, elements which each national preventive mechanism must possess in order to function effectively as stipulated in OPCAT. There needs to be legal basis, there needs to be functional independence of this body as well as independence of its uh, personnel. And there needs to be some um, uh, key elements within its mandate which must be provided for very clearly in which the NPM must be able to exercise effectively such as wide visiting powers um, in relation to all of the place of deprivation of liberty in the country. There needs to be unimpeded rec uh, access provided. The state authorities must engage with the recommendations provided by the National Preventive Mechanism in a good faith. And um, National Preventive Mechanisms need to be able to work with the legislation. Um, and of course, as well as engage with training and awareness raising um, exercises in the country. But what is not provided for OPCAT, while well, it does set out these broad features it does not give you a blueprint of this is how the national preventive mechanism must look like. Um, and I think that's absolutely correct, because if a national preventive mechanism even is to have a chance at this very complex task of preventing torture and ill treatment in the country, it must be suited to the specifics, geopolitical, social, economic structures in the country because one size does not fit all. The national preventive mechanism, and it's important that the state chooses the national preventive mechanism, be it one organization or a number of organizations working together, 
that fits the country. And we do see at the moment when we look at the structures of our national preventive mechanism, there are broadly, we can distinguish four different trends. Um, number of um, countries are designated the national human rights commissions. So the national human rights institutions, which have been established most of, the, most of them in accordance with the Paris principles. We have designation of existing ombudsman offices we have designation of a number of institutions which together carry out NPM functions. There's of course certain challenges there when it comes down especially to coordination of the tasks. Um, you can see um, some uh, uh, countries like Slovenia, Moldova, where national preventive mechanism mandate is carried out by the Ombudsman Office together with civil society organizations. And then the very, I must say, big minority among the OPCAT state parties have chosen to create an entirely new institution for the purposes of national preventive mechanism. And perhaps that's not surprising given um, the amount of resources that requires. So that's a very brief overview of, of OPCAT, of the national preventive mechanisms and their role in um, uh, uh, prison monitoring. I will very quickly, um, conscious of time, run over um, European Committee on Prevention of Torture, uh, the mandate rather of this body, um, and then pass back to Andrea to talk about, to, to conclude, and then we'll give you an opportunity um, to ask any questions that you might have. So European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment of Punishment, the CPT, uh, is the treaty body which is set up to monitor the implementation of the 1987 European Convention on Prevention of Torture. And in many respects, the fundamentals of uh, CPT and of this um, convention are very similar to OPCAT. And well, probably um, for those of you who know the drafting history, what comes as no surprise was that when um, uh, United Nations Convention Against Torture was adopted, there was a plan to already then to have this um, monitoring, this type of um, OPCAT uh, system in place, but it was impossible to reach an agreement on the international scene. But that agreement was possible in Europe. So Europe has uh, had... Um, I think it is absolutely fair to say most advanced system of preventing torture um, and ill treatment among the regions of the world um, for um, quite a long time, nearly uh, 50 years now. So the committee, the CPT, is composed of as many members as there are parties to the European Torture Convention, of which currently there are 47. And the CPT operates very similar to the way um, I ex explained extensively the mandate of the SPT. It also um, does not receive any state reports, rather it goes and visits places of deprivation of liberty in state parties um, and uh, issues a report. One thing that the system of the European Committee on Prevention of Torture does not have is the uh, element of national preventive mechanisms, but we'll um, come back to that in, uh, in just a minute. So there are relatively extended powers in uh, how the S uh, uh, CPT can exercise its mandate. So as I said, it has access to state parties' territory and the right to travel within that territory without any restriction. It has access to full information on the place where persons are deprived of their liberty, unlimited access to any such place, including the right to move inside that facility without any restriction, and any other information available to state party that is necessary for the committee to carry out its tasks or to be provided as the private of their liberty in private and communicate freely with any person who it believes can supply any relevant information for the implementation of its mandate, especially so during the country visits. Um, so it is um, mandatory, um, its jurisdiction, it can visit all states parties, which are states parties to the European Torture Convention at all times. And the output of the visit is initially confidential uh, report, um, but the state can request its publication 
And um, there is also so-called automatic publication procedure uh, when a state makes a general request saying that whenever the CPT issues a report, we will publish it. So de facto, the mandate is very similar to what I was describing to you about the United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, but that the European Convention does not provide for the establishment of the national preventive mechanisms. It doesn't mean that the CPT does not engage with the national preventive mechanisms during its uh, uh, visits to states parties, um, but um, if we look on a, on a legal setting, the national preventive mechanisms are shall we say, a product of the optional protocol to Convention Against Torture rather than the European Convention. Um, very briefly, I wanted to mention the currently uh, specific situation with Russia. As you know, uh, Russia withdrew from the Council of Europe, but nevertheless, uh, it remains a state party to the European Torture Convention, and at least um, on paper, the CPT um, is able to visit, um, still carry out visits to Russia. Um, so this is me. I will stop now. Um, sorry, I took a bit, perhaps a bit longer. Um, Andrea, back to you. No worries. Thanks, Elena. Um, so I'm going to conclude with hopefully giving you a few tips on how to engage with prison monitoring bodies and, and what you can expect of how they carry out their mandate. Um, and I think it's been really helpful that Elena talked about doing a bit of a mapping exercise so you know who the prison monitoring bodies are, whether it's like a formal function or it's kind of de facto, whether they recognise it as such or not. Um, but also part of this bigger jigsaw puzzle um, is those kind of um, oversight mechanisms that respond to alleged incidents and systemic issues in places of detention. So they really, they're almost like corrective mechanisms that focus on um, an action or a response after the issues have already arisen. And Elena has already spoken about this, um, that that's different to the prevention mandate. But I'm just going to give you some examples of what those bodies are, because I think there's um, at least I can say in, in the Australian context, it's a bit of confusion about what actually prevention is versus um, the, the reactionary or reactive mandate. Um, so corrective mechanisms can include um, independent statutory bodies like an ombudsman. So there are the non-MPM functions, so they can conduct investigations, um, audits or respond to complaints. Um, I think that some of you might be um, involved in civil litigation, so that's who are in the audience today or participants today. So that includes pursuing um, compensation or perhaps just a particular outcome. I've talked about a coronial inquest into deaths in custody. So that sort of um, post-death investigation. And there's broader systemic inquiries and royal commissions. There's criminal prosecutions um, for alleged wrongdoing by staff who work in places of detention. Um, and there's regulatory bodies um, who perform a range of functions and have different focuses, for example, workplace health and safety for staff. Um, and all of those bodies have sort of varying degrees of efficacy um, and their intention is to seek truth and justice and accountability for ill treatment. So they respond after someone's already been harmed or there's been allegations of harm to an individual or a group um, of people. And we're kind of, I think, primarily focusing on um, preventing torture before um, the ill treatment happens. So kind of figuring out where the NPM bodies or prevention bodies, the CPT, the SPT, where they fit into the jigsaw puzzle um, is important because then it can help you understand what their mandate is and what your expectations of there are. Um, and then, of course, in turn, how you might engage with them um, effectively. Um, Elaine has also mentioned that torture prevention has been described um, as focusing on the root causes uh, of torture and it also looks at those kind of complex factors that allow torture to happen so we're not looking at individual levels of violation um, and I think this is key it's really been purposefully left broad and non-prescriptive what is prevention and I think that's a strength, even though it can seem a bit confusing um, when you first kind of step into this space. 
Um, so when we're looking at root causes of detention, we could consider overcrowding in places of detention. Um, so a former UN special rapporteur on torture has said that that leads to a decline in standards of detention. And Alina's kind of spoken about how if these issues are ongoing, we could lead, it could lead to um, ill treatment or even torture. Um, so for example, an MPM might look at um, what sort of laws lead to a disproportionate number of people in prisons. So for example, overly restrictive bail laws. Um, and in fact, uh, a former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has stated that avoiding imprisonment in the first place is one of the most effective safeguards against torture and ill treatment. And that sentence has really resonated and it's really stayed with me. And I always come back to that in, in sort of the prevention work that I've engaged with thus far. Um, and I think it's really important, everyone who's um, watching this now or, or participating today, this recording, um, each of the contexts in which you're working is unique. Um, so when we're looking at the NPM bodies in your jurisdiction, in your country, the resourcing they have will be different. Um, the legislated powers they have will vary. Um, your own government's compliance with OPCAT will vary. Um, when the NPM was established will differ. So you'll have, I guess, different maturity of different NPMs across the globe. Um, it's also going to, also a relevant factor is where previously existing bodies are then given this NPM OPCAT mandate, which is, as Alina has said, the vast majority of cases, um, they'll come with a certain, I guess, culture and way of doing things that's going to also bleed into or, or impact on how they exercise this NPM preventive mandate. Um, and that's going to affect its priorities as well. Um, so I think figuring that out is going to be really key in deciding how you can engage effectively with them. And also if you want part of your role to be um, influencing how it exercises its mandate, it's, under, it's useful to understand where that NPM is coming from um, generally. Um, you know, for example, I know for a fact, I've spoken to colleagues in different NPMs around Australia and around the world and not everyone um, shares my interpretation of what a preventive mandate could look like. So as we all know, lawyers love to debate laws. They enjoy nothing more um, and legal interpretation. So taking that time to get an understanding of your NPM will really be key to your ability to engage with it effectively. Um, Alina's referred to this empirical study a few times, and um, I think it's useful to kind of, one of the, the quotes that comes from that study um, will hopefully give you hope in, in your engagement with NPMs going forward. But they said that um, strongly independent institutions that have engaged in effective mon monitoring, often in politically unfavorable circumstances, what they had in common was, was a solid legal basis for their independence, vigorous and often courageous leadership, and the capacity to build alliances with civil society organizations. So there's already been an acknowledgement of the role that you can play in this space. Um, so you probably are wondering what can you do practically to actually cooperate or engage with these prison monitoring bodies. Um, one of the things you could do is raise the profile of their mandate. Um, so that's both among the public and for um, with incarcerated people. You can deliver training to NPM staff. Chinzia has already provided some training to the Australian NPM, for example, on harm reduction. Um, we will have to... Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. Um, you can also, um, assuming that the NPM is willing and that's where building that relationship is going to be really key, but you could contribute to the development of their monitoring framework and the expectation and standards that they use, um, particularly we're talking about harm reduction today. Um, you can provide information to the NPMs um, that could assist in developing their own strategy or preparation for particular visits um, because they need to decide how to deploy the limited resources they have. So they need to identify where the highest risks of torture and ill treatment are. Um, and then incorporating, if you agree with them, of course, but if you agree with the NPM um, findings and recommendations, you can then take those forward in your own prevention work and rely on those and kind of advocate for the implementation of those recommendations and do some of that monitoring of the, the recommendation implementations. Um, another 
thing that I think is really key that civil society can do because NPMs might not be able to always go um, back into places that they visited previously is um, seeing if there's been any reprisal. So if there's been any negative consequences for detained people where they've engaged with the NPM, um, it's prohibited um, under the treaty, um, but whether that what's happening in practice is a different question. So of course, if you hear of anything like that, giving that information to the NPM is really key. Um, and then another important part is evaluating the efficacy of their work. And you can't do that well unless you have a proper understanding of what their mandate is, because there's only certain function that, functions that they're actually meant to be carrying out. Um, Aline has also spoken about that training and policy and legislative work of an NPM. Um, so different NGOs, different society, civil society actors bring different expertise to the table. So providing that input when an NPM is develop, developing its own policy positions around the criminal legal system, for example, is going to be really um, important. Um, and then in terms of how you can build those relationships. Again, there's no one size fits all um, for these things. Um, it can be a formal or informal arrangement depending on the context and that can also change over time, of course. Um, there could be sort of regular meetings with um, NGOs and NPMs um, or there could be sort of an annual type forum where these issues are discussed. Um, you could have an official advisory committee, which is the case in some places um, where they're kind of those advisory committees uh, made up of civil society actors that are individual experts or they um, are representatives of an NGO that has particular expertise like um, Harm Reduction International, for example. Also, if there's particular visits um, where certain expertise is needed, then consultants can be engaged. Um, so again, for example, if there's a particular thematic focus across multiple prisons in your country, um, looking at appropriate harm reduction strategies, um, there might be an opportunity for HRI to be involved. Um, and I think that it's really important for me to also have a caveat when I say all of these things that you could potentially do with uh, when it comes to engaging with an NPM and it would be remiss of me not to emphasize the importance of having realistic expectations when engaging with prison monitoring bodies. Um, Elena's kind of outlined the mandate of the MPMs and that always needs to be um, kept in mind when assessing um, the MPMs performance. Um, they're not an NGO, they have a different function. Um, and I hope Elena doesn't mind, but I actually want to quote you on the issue of independence of um, monitoring bodies. Um, NPMs and other monitoring, well, I'll just talk about NPMs actually. Um, NPMs are independent from both government and detaining authorities and from NGOs, um, so like yourselves or civil society actors. Um, and she's kind of highlighted in her own work that, that the NPM's unique status is based on its ability to build a particular type of relationship with detaining authorities rather than the role of an NGO. Um, and the focus is on constructive dialogue given the prevention mandate and this can make it more powerful than an NGO. So Alina has said previously, in case you haven't heard from her enough today, I'll give you some more. Um, so as not to be perceived as, uh, so as not to be perceived to be a part of civil society, which may become detrimental to NPM's dialogue with um, authorities. And this is like a very difficult line to tread. It's important that NPMs themselves are clear about the division of work and definition of roles and responsibilities. Um, otherwise, there's a real risk of loss of independence, especially perceived independence. And the moment an NPM is kind of seen as an NGO adjacent, um, then it can undermine sort of its, its really crucial work. And I say this as a long term NGO. That's where most of my career has been at Aboriginal Legal Services. Um, so at the end of the day, they build different relationships to government than what than what you do. Um, but again, having said that, there will be times when monitoring bodies make errors in their strategies or finding or recommendations. And that's when I think you can play a really crucial role in bringing it to their attention. Of course, always keeping in mind that there are times when these bodies, by virtue of the extent of the access they have or should have under legislation, 
um, to relevant information. So that's video footage, electronic records, um, confidential interviews with detained people. They, they'll have access to systems and information and data that you might not have. Um, so they might make decisions based on information that's not available to you. So it might seem a bit strange, but I, I still think that NGOs have a really important role to at least approach an NPM and say, look, I'm not sure why you, you made this finding or this recommendation. My clients have said something different or, you know, whatever. Um, and then, so that's kind of the role that NGOs can play um, with regards to the NPM, but they can also play a really important role with the SPT where Alina works. Um, and so, for example, in the Australian context, the SPT visited last year and in advance, um, quite a number of NGOs, including where I was working at the time, the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, we made submissions to the SPT um, because we are working with people who are incarcerated every single day and we know the specific context um, of our country or state or, or territory. Um, and then uh, I hope Alina doesn't mind me saying this and everything I say from here is me and not Alina. I just feel like I need to make that clear because she is an SPT member. But um, you may be aware, but initially the SPT um, suspended its visit to Australia and then it terminated its visit and it, it cited that a lack of cooperation on the part of the government, um, which it had sort of voluntarily signed up to by ratifying OPCAT. And following the, the suspension and the termination, civil society was a very kind of um, active advocate in this space, um, advocating for the Australian and state and territory governments to comply with, with their OPCAT obligations. Um, so that's kind of one role that they can play. And then even, um, you know, post that, the, we know that the UNSPT has provided a confidential report to the Australian government. And it's important to note here that it is at the discretion of the Australian government, whether they decide to make that report public or not. Um, but a few days ago, the Australian Human Rights Commissioner called on the Australian government to make it publicly available so that we can all benefit from the ex expertise of the SPT. So that's the government, detaining authorities, civil society, um, and that kind of call was supported by NGOs as well. So you can see there's a few different ways um, that NGOs can sort of be involved in this space, whether that's with the um, NPMs directly, with the SPT, or with um, the governments of your respective countries. And that includes um, advocating for proper implementation of OPCAT and compliance with its obligations, as Alina's kind of talked you through today around legislation and resourcing um, and all those kind of other factors outlined in the OPCAT. And I will end there, which only gives us 10 minutes for questions, but hopefully that's okay. And I might turn the light on. It's gotten progressively darker where I am. Thank you so, so much, both Elena and Andrea, for your presentation. Um, it, it, it's been amazing to, amazing to run through this, this uh, uh, overview of uh, different prison monitoring bodies, where, where they sit, what's the mandate, I really retain the 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 uh, the attention to understanding how they work, which Monday they have the different nature of monitoring bodies in different countries, from the UN ones down down to the state ones, civil society ones, and I really think the title alliances. The world has been used by Elena and Andrea a few times, so this idea that we are all together, each each body with their own mandate, but we can all contribute to each other's work in positive ways. And Andrea was really great in giving us some really concrete tips on how to make this happen uh, locally. We have just a few minutes left uh, in case people still wanted to um, put questions in the chat. Uh, I'm just reading out this one uh, that uh, Elena kindly answered to already. Uh, Titiana was asking, what do you think about community-led monitoring in a framework of uh, prison monitoring bodies? Should it be the additional separate independent tool to provide monitoring in, in penitentiary facilities? Uh, we have definitely in, uh, in the harm reduction uh, uh, arena uh, a lot of focus on um, on on people's first and on uh, community voices and people's voices so I think that this community-led monitoring idea comes from there and uh, um, I, I also will read Elena's uh, response here any type of monitoring within prison facilities or other places of detention must be viewed as positive let us not forget that torture and ill treatment takes place in darker places so uh, the more there are monitors, the better. But all of these bodies should strive to work together in, in synergy. So that's the, I think the core message which comes out from this uh, 
uh, training today. And I'm just checking if there's any other questions in the uh, chat. Elina has put some further um, information into the chat. Thank you very much. Um, I just wonder if Elina or Andrea have additional things to say on this community. Uh, you can also raise your hands, yeah, in case you wanted to uh, be heard. And in the meantime, just Elina and Andrea, if you have any final words while we, well, wait, there's a hand raised. Uh, yeah, Titiana, um, would you like to speak? Uh, yeah, you have the floor. Uh, so, hello everyone, my name is Tanya, I represent the Eurasian Movement for the Right to Health and Business. So, uh, thank you both, Elena and Andrea, for your presentations. They were awesome, but, uh, and uh, also thank you, Elena, for your answer in chat box, but still um, your answer is a little bit general. So <laughs> if you're kind to provide more detail um, thoughts on uh, community-led monitoring in framework prison monitoring bodies, because today we heard uh, just uh, about two uh, tools and uh, I think that community-led monitoring is um, like a new emerging tool to provide um, timely monitoring in the prison facilities. So thank you. Sure. Um, I mean, it is the reason why they aren't, my answer was general was that I consider the question to be general. Jenna. You see, the problem when you talk about specific monitoring, you cannot talk about a, a, a specific monitoring mechanism outside the context in which it operates. Because the community-led mechanism, community-led monitoring works in, the, in my opinion and my personal experience. So uh, prior to um, joining uh, Working Group Now Detention, SPT, everything, so nearly 20 years ago, I was part of the independent monitoring board of Bristol Prison which is community-based monitoring um, in the United Kingdom. Now, this is a body which was, um, you know, a, a type of monitoring which has nearly hundreds of years um, uh, history in the United Kingdom across the board. Um, it is very well respected. It has access, um, etc., and it had enormous contribution uh, to be made. And now the independent monitoring boards are part of the UK National Preventive Mechanism in accordance with OPCAP. Would that system work in another country? I certainly hope so, but to give you exactly how should it work, it should correspond to this specific situation in the country. So if you are asking me about the community-led monitoring in a country, then we need to be very specific if you want a more specific answer from me. because. The problem what we have seen with some of the monitoring mechanism, uh, mechanisms are that the ideas of them have been borrowed from a different jurisdiction, different context, and they simply don't work because they are not tailored to the specific context. They are not anchored in the tradition in the country. They are um, not constructed in a way that complements the existing structures and existing mechanisms. And I think this is something we also need to be very um, aware of. And there is, um, so we say tendency, or it seems like, well, it works in this country, let's do that that way then, without actually finding out what you have in your country, what's working already in your country, what isn't working in your country, and adapting that to work. And the problem with borrowing, with importing, monitoring tradition from another country, always will be that, it will be foreign. And because what you are requiring of the prison monitors, the only way prison monitors can be effective is if they establish this relationship of trust this dialogue with the authorities, that cannot be imported. So you have to make sure that whatever institutional structures you put in place, that they actually fit your country. So yes, in my opinion, uh, community-based monitoring is great, but in order to give you a more precise answer as to how it should work, I need to know more about the country as well as about the mechanism. That's me, Andrea, please. 
Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Elena just said. Um, and I've, I've actually done some research um, looking at sort of the UK and New Zealand and, and what could and couldn't work in Australia. Um, and I think what I would really add is community-based monitoring. The members who are part of that should represent who is incarcerated. And so um, I guess that's just more of a thing to think about in terms of a risk. Um, so, for example, in Australia, shamefully and devastatingly, there's a huge overrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So community-based monitoring would have to include Aboriginal people. It couldn't be a whole um, team of people who look like me. That wouldn't be appropriate and it wouldn't be effective. Um, and so I think it's important to have the trust of the authorities, but you also have to have the trust of the detained people. And so there needs to be that sort of representation. Um, and I think there's a real strength also, um, and there's definitely moves in this space um, in the torture prevention sort of monitoring um, bodies of having people with lived experience be a part of that. So again, because we're kind of talking about harm reduction, it would be invaluable if I were going in in a team to have someone who has experience of, of using drugs and what services did and didn't work for them. So that would be kind of the main point I would add. Community monitoring should represent the community that's in, incarcerated. And in immigration detention, you would want to have people who um, have asylum seeker refugee backgrounds, et cetera. Thank you very, very much, both Alina and Andrea. It's been uh, really great to listen to you this morning. I think we are quickly running towards the end of this uh, of this seminar. I don't see other other questions. Uh, we, uh, just for the information, we will make the recordings available on HRI's uh, channel. So check out our website in the following weeks and you will find uh, the recording from this. And uh, we stay in touch with Andrea and Alina and, and hopefully we have other opportunities to, uh, to get together and uh, to follow up the very useful conversation we've had this morning. I don't know if Arjun wants to give a final word of goodbye to our participant uh, on our behalf. Thank you, Arjun. Yes, a quick, again, echoing uh, Kinsia's thanks to Elena and Andrea and also to all the participants for um, joining us um, today. And some of you even joined uh, the session yesterday as well. I hope these two online trainings have been useful um, for your work. Please do send us uh, emails for more questions um, and we'll uh, make sure that the, the recording will be available hopefully soon. Um, have a good rest of the day and uh, Alina, Andrea, thanks again and Chinzia as well, thanks for the moderation. Thank you. Thank you everyone.